Oh, you know, look at that smile. Okay, so thank you for coming. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, we just, we, we, we just remembered that um, Deborah and I first met in 1980. 92. 92, not 82. 92, which you've worked out as 27 years. And we were both invited to the start of the sort of organizational global thing, which was the Institute for the Pilates Method in Santa Fe. And we were both young. We were young then. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's really difficult to do this conversation because, of course, we've been conversing. But there, there are some things that have really struck me over the last couple of days that I thought would be useful to bring forward. Um, one of which was... How did you train as a Pilates teacher originally? Good question. Um, I went to Corolla as a client. Um, she immediately started asking me if I would teach, and I kept putting her off and putting her off because I was only there to enhance my dance technique. And um, unbeknownst to me, within a year, I started transitioning out of dance, and I thought, well, maybe I should do this. What else am I doing that's so important? And I thought, this is a much better part-time job than many of the other choices. Mm. So I acquiesced. I spent an entire summer trailing her. So I was there all day, every day, literally walking behind her, listening to her every word, and at some point I was allowed to take the handles and put them down and move the box back into its perfect position. Um, but no talking to the clients, nothing like that. But I was still exercising. And then at some point I was allowed to start doing one exercise with the clients, and then another, and then another. And that's kind of how it happened. Um, I was proficient in my own body, and I also had a lot of teaching experience in dance before right. that. So things kind of happened pretty quickly. And I worked in the afternoon. So I was at the Graham School in the morning taking class, and then I would go to Corolla's and work the afternoon shift and there were usually two other teachers, right. and then after a year there was only one other teacher, plus Corolla, and she was not well. She had a heart condition. And her medication routinely wore off at about 3.30 in the afternoon, and so when I got the nerve up, because she got really grouchy, I'd say, girl, why don't, why don't you go in and lie down? Because it was her apartment. Mm -hmm. And so she did. And, you know, from then on, I was kind of in, of independent during those hours when she'd go in and lie down. Was that in the, the 80s? That, yeah, that was 1981. Mm -hmm. So I started with her as a client in 1980. Um, and then I worked there for, yeah. for a couple of years. And, um, and I learned a tremendous amount from her. But after several female choreographers who were very domineering and not very nice, I just, I just reached my lifetime cap. Um, and really the issue that made me leave was tucking, which I've brought up in the workshops. So, you know, in my dance career, I'd have one person that said, tuck and then another that said, don't tuck. And after years of that, I was so confused. I just wanted to find a way to work. And what gave me that was the reformer. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got on it, I felt where I could release and where I needed to work. Um, Corolla still tucked like crazy, and particularly on her high back chair, which now I make, um, she would tell people when they were standing on one leg to lean forward into their thigh, literally leaning into their quads. And when she walked away, I'd go over to them and I'd bring their pelvis back and tell them to feel their hamstrings. So one day, she 
ventured over while I was working with somebody. And by the way, she had mirrors throughout the studio, so wherever you were, she could see you and hear you, except on that chair. So she came over and she said, what you what, what's all this about? <laughs> and I thought, okay, the moment of truth. And I explained to her, and she paused and she said, well, I suppose you're the expert now. And I thought, oh, God, I'm out of here. Um, it was sad in a way because I really wanted a mentor to keep learning from, but she wasn't giving anymore. Mm. Mm. Um, part of it was her age mm. and having trained so many people on the job. Mm. I mean, this is why teacher training came about, mm. because those old teachers were practically pulling people off the street to come in and work. And a lot of them had very little Pilates training, and then all of a sudden they're on the floor. You know, and the teachers were learning from the other teachers. Yep. <clears throat> um, Romana used to call, Kathy used to call. There were teachers that worked for all three of them, or two out of three of them. So it's amazing. Ooh, don't touch the mic. It's amazing that, you know, just a few years later, um, that the tension grew between Romana and Carola and Kathy because of the lawsuit. Right. Because Romana took the reins and said, I, I'm, I'm the, holding the mantle of Pilates, which <clears throat> the other two ladies thought was egotistical in the most amazing way. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that that whole thing. I mean, it, the, it happened here too that there were only three studios, you know, and then Sean Gallagher reared his head, and suddenly we had that issue. So I I, I copyrighted the name of my <coughs> studio at the time just to try and protect myself from Sean, and somebody in this country went, oh, Hannah's trying to hold on to the word Pilates, which actually was not my intention. I was trying to protect it. And um, that Pilates Foundation came out of that. So we had that first group copyright, trademark. We also, unfortunately, you know, it, it was such an intention. It was a good intention. The, uh, the trademark registry recognized Pilates as a generic term, and we thought that would be great because then everybody could use the word Pilates. And what happened is we then got H2O Pilates and Yoga Lattes and... Pilates, what's that one? A really hard Pilates. Ten Pilates. Oh, well, we've got ten Pilates. Yeah, anyway, Pilates is now. And, and, you know, we didn't know that that would happen. Or maybe we should have held Pilates as not generic. I think generic. we were all naive. Um, when something goes into the open market, <clears throat> that's, that's what it becomes. But that is still preferable to having someone own and control it. Yep. And that's what Mr. Gallagher's Still intention to. was. Yeah. He wanted to own uh, half of every <clears throat> Pilates studio, and he wanted to control all teacher training. So um, <clears throat> I imagine he thought that I was an easy target because I had a little studio, and I taught Matt at a gym somewhere, mm. um, but he tangled with the wrong babe. <laughs> One of the things you said yesterday um, in our conversation at the table was that our generation is defining the profession of teaching Pilates. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, the people that taught in the Pilates studio when Joe was alive um, were not paid. They were not trained to teach. They were just proficient in Pilates. Mm -hmm. And um, their remuneration was they got to exercise. Yep. And they learned pretty quickly. I, I know this because Lolita talks about it, that they would try to exercise during his lunch break when he wasn't, he was having his gin and tonic. Um, and and was, that was a very giving time of his day. 
So, so they got a lot from him. Mm. Um, Carola was the first one to have her own studio, which uh, he helped her Set up. put together. Um, he supervised the building of her equipment. Um, and so she was my model for professionalism. She had an accountant, and she had a towel service, and she had a bookkeeper, and the teachers had to learn all aspects of it, you know, how she kept um, the files on the clients, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and money going mm -hmm. in and out, and all of this stuff, and cleaning, you could eat off the floor in her, mm -hmm. in her studio. Mm -hmm. um, and everything had to be just a certain way. And you could count on it. And, you know, that seemed very rigid when I was young. But now I totally get it. If I walk in the studio and things aren't in their place, it's disturbing. I don't feel like I can be at ease and do it's, what I need to it's do. It's interesting that you say that because I'm, you know, Alan did some of his training. So I, I come down the Alan Herdman lineage but, of course, Alan did some of his training with Carolla and, and, and Bob Fitzgerald, right? And Gordon trained with Alan, and I trained with Gordon. And I'm hearing some of the stuff that must have passed from <laughs> Carolla to Alan to Gordon and now to me. That, you know, so when I trained with Gordon, I wasn't paid. You know, I, I kept money coming into my family by temping as legal secretary two, three days a week, but I was in the studio from 10 to 8 every day, and Conchita, you'll remember that, it was like non-stop, right? Exactly the same thing, and then, and, and initially I was like you, following everywhere, and if I was lucky I could hand some weights over, or maybe say breathe in, <laughs> Yeah. and then the odd exercise, but mirrors everywhere. Yeah. And leotards everywhere, too. So really what's changed is there was no formal teacher yeah. training. It was 100% apprenticeship. And that is the facet that's really lost mm. now in mm. teacher training, the apprenticeship of um, having a lot of exposure to someone very experienced so that you know, you know what choices they're making. That's and you can... You know, ask, why did you choose to do it this mm -hmm. way? Mm -hmm. Or watching how you progress a client over time. More than you anything. have to be in the studio. Yeah. And a new client is going to be doing a lot of progressing for the first year. So you've got to be there at least that long. Um, also to see the work on many different mm. bodies. Mm. Um, and see a garden mm. variety of injuries. Um, Carola used to talk about Joe mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. and she was very specific. This is how Joe did it. These are the words that he used. Um, and she also told us things that she changed or added. And um, Kathy Grant said that, that Joe encouraged them to make up their own exercises mm -hmm. as long that. as they were good. Yeah. Um, so if there was a protocol that didn't exist for, you know, whatever physical problem, those teachers started made, making them up. And mm -hmm. we're learning all that stuff now. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of this, this body of work from Eve Gentry is just brilliant. Yeah. Um, Carola studied anatomy extensively. Right. Um, I don't know if you all know this, but the way she met Joe, she had a dance injury and went to... A, very well-known orthopedist in New York who happened to be friends with Joe Pilates. Mm -hmm. And so this doctor sent her to Joe to do her re rehabilitation. Yeah. But he really liked her, and so he invited her to take all of his courses. Oh, okay. um, I went to the Library of Performing Arts after she passed away, and her anatomy book, every page was full of notes wow. in all of the columns. Cool. And she... she uh, spoke anatomy in Latin. Wow. I mean, she knew it backwards and forwards. So when I left her, I thought, oh my God, I don't have that knowledge. And I need to seek it out. Or I can never 
be as good as she was. But I think one of the things that you have, and certainly I was, I was just going to ask you about the whole anatomy thing, because, of course, trainings now, you know, you've got to have the anatomy and there's all this biomechanics and, and it feels quite mechanical. And what I learned, is, I, mean, I didn't have a very basic anatomy, but what I really learned was to see, to look, to see, to feel, and to try things out. And be willing to say, oh, that's not working, let's try this. Whereas now it's, it's much more here if you've got the contraindications and the... Da -da 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 -da. Is that where you went with the anatomy as well? It's like you, you started with the scene and moved to the anatomy? Because that's certainly been my journey. I actually, because of people that I knew at that time, I studied a little um, Bartenia fundam mm -hmm. fundamentals, mm -hmm. um, some Laban. I took a couple of things with Irene Dowd way back. Wow. Um, but it didn't grab me at that point. Yeah. I just seeked out things that resonated with me at that time. And as I progressed, I wanted different things. Mm. I ended up studying with Irene for about three years, yes. everything that she taught. But then I felt like I was getting pulled off into a different direction. Mm -hmm. And th this is really where our defining our own profession comes in. In general, before teacher training existed, Pilates teachers, and they were only at a handful of studios, didn't really regard what they were doing as a profession. And how do you, how do you make that, that leap? It's really a giant leap. Part of it is that we don't feel confident that what we're doing is valid and important. I think that that's changed. I think it's also, I mean, I've certainly seen it with younger teachers around me, and, and, and I've had it myself in my youth, not so much now, where if somebody came in who was medically qualified, like a physio, I would pull back because they had the medical qualification. So even though I knew how to apply my knowledge to the movement, if they said something, I, I would defer. And it, but, but it would be a conflict inside me. Now I don't defer, but it, that, that's, I, I can stand behind it because I've got the decades. But Can I just um, qualify this a little bit? Yeah. So most of the clients that came to Corollas came through the students of this Dr. Henry Jordan, wow. who were now the next generation of the top orthopedists in New York one of whom was William Hamilton, who was the founder of I. Adams. Yep. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was working for Corolla, um, he, Marika was working in his office, and he sent Marika to observe. And she had to sit on the bench at the side and not move. Well, that, <laughs> I mean, that, that's really fortunate in, in New York that you had that, because here we've had to sort of prove ourselves. But, but the difference is that I thought that all Pilates teachers had this kind of relationship with the medical community that they were sending their patients and Dr. Jordan knew enough Pilates that he would say, do these exercises, this many repetitions on this much resistance and then let's regroup after six weeks. So Carola would go back with the client to their doctor's appointment. As a matter of fact, she was invited to watch their surgeries. Mm. Um, I have a few old photographs of, of Corolla with, with Dr. Jordan. Um, and, and I thought that's what it was. Mm. I didn't know that other people mm. didn't, didn't work that way. And so they had bridged that gray area between what we do and medicine. Mm. I think the defining thing for me was realizing the difference between the medical approach and our approach. Yep. So the medical approach is very site specific yep. and our approach is whole body integration all the time. Yep. Exactly what Joe Absolutely. presents in Return to Life. Holistic. Yep. Return to Life. Hold that thought for a minute. There was something I was going to say and I've lost it. Oh yes. <laughs> um, 
it's not so common in the United States, as I understand it, for people to be teaching only mat work. Most teachers in the United States are what we would call comprehensive teachers. Is that right? Yeah. And so, um, yeah, what, what's your feeling about that? Okay, well, you were actually part of this. Do you remember before we went to the Institute that they sent out a questionnaire asking people who were filling out this questionnaire what their opinion was about starting learning mat work first? And I don't know about you, but I'm the only one I know of that said, no, don't learn the mat work first. It's too hard. hard. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the clients are going to learn those movements by gripping. Mm -hmm. And then you have to undo all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. He created the equipment to support the body right. more so that you could work more yeah. specifically. I mean, we may work way too specifically, and he might think that it's kind of crazy, but... <laughs> but, the, but, but, but what we know is that if we progress through it, they get to whole body movement, but they're working in a balanced way, right? Yes. Um, I was saying to you last night uh, that, that you know one of the reasons why it came about here was because Lynn Robinson was trying to make Pilates available to people outside of London. And without the equipment, the only thing that she felt was possible was the, the mat work. Would you recommend, I certainly would recommend, but I want to hear it from you too, that somebody who's trained in mat work only, that if they really want to get the, the fullness of this work, do the comprehensive training. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think you can understand the whole body of the work if you've never used the equipment. That's my feeling. I, to I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Return to life. You made some reference to it last night. Let's see if I can find my note. We've got about two minutes left. Um, there, was, um, there was a note. There was a note. Oh, it was about the healthy living. The three yes. guiding principles. Let's okay. finish with that. Shall All we? right. So um, to me, part of our professional responsibility is um, asking our clients because, you know, this comes up in their physical condition, how they're sleeping, mm. how they're eating. Even if they come in for their session and they haven't eaten anything mm. all day, not a good idea to exercise. How much water do you drink? Yes. I, I had a client who's a very evolved man, very intelligent, and, and he was always cramping, and I asked him if he was drinking enough water, and he thought for a minute, and he said, you know, the Japanese just drink these tiny little cups of green tea. And I thought for a minute, and I said, yeah, but they lost the war. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, people just get these, these ideas that stick. Um, we all do. And hopefully someone just comes and hits us up the side of the head and we go, oh, okay, I see that now. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so um, as far as lifestyle is concerned, we have to have recreation, which is really hard to get to. We have to have quiet time. We have to have adequate nutrition. Now, it's not our job to teach our clients nutrition, but they have to know that at a certain point, they're not going to continue feeling better unless all of these things are improving. And the better they feel in, the bo in their body, the more they're going to want to improve their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, or even walking more. Yeah, because, of course, I always used to say that, um, you know, Pilates is great, but there, there isn't a huge amount, depending on how you do it, of aerobic action in there. And that we need to swim or walk or, or something that keeps us cardiovascularly yes. fit. Yes, and um, that's interesting because some Pilates teachers have made Pilates aerobic. And um, it, they're apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. You just can't combine them that way. And we could go into all the changes that have been made in the apparatus, but I am aware that we have a workshop coming up. <laughs> and um, 
I think we'll, we'll, we'll just give, if, if that's okay, if anybody's got a burning question that they want to put to, to Deborah at this point. No burning questions. <laughs> Have we covered everything? We could, we could go on. We'll we could go on for hours. <laughs> join us for a drink later. Deborah. thank you so much for being here, for coming. Um, I'd forgotten that I'd suggested you, so I'm so grateful that you're in my life. <laughs> and um, April also, thank you so much for helping and just being you and what you're going to bring to and have brought already. Likewise. On that note, blessings on our continuing time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.